Great, Andrew. Um, thanks so much. That is actually Suffolk University here in Boston. So let me just make sure I can work my slides. Okay, super. Um, so my presentation today is about feelings, as the title implies, um, but it touches on larger issues that are affecting all of us in market research because, you know, building, I think, a lot on, on some of the things John just was talking about, it is really a very exciting time to be in this industry. Um, I'm going to start today by talking about some of the tensions that are shaping our industry as a result, um, and as a result of that, um, how those are affecting our work and the way we approach our work. I'm going to make a case particularly for why humanistic methods, um, particularly those that elicit and require empathy, are critically important given where we are as a field. And I'm going to share a number of examples from client work to illustrate some of my points. So um, I'd like to start just by talking about tension. When I hear the word tension, and maybe you feel the same way out there, um, I usually think of something bad. Tension, headaches, feeling tense, strain, um, and so on. Um, but recently I was at the SMR Congress and I heard Wendy Clark, who's the SVP of Integrated Marketing Communications and Capabilities um, at Coca-Cola, speak on a panel. And she used the term good tension um, a number of times. And I was really intrigued and taken by it. What she was referring to was the push and pull that we all experience um, in life, but particularly so in this business. Uh, for example, you know, we want irrefutable facts and we want an inspiring, shareable story. We want to deliver both rigor and creativity. Um, and we need to be able to measure outcomes, but we also, I think as John eloquently stated, we really need to figure out how to take action. Um, and when we work with various colleagues or suppliers you know, across the industry, we, com we encounter um, competing perspectives and strengths and priorities all the time. So you know, I think it's true that we don't really get to have it all, um, and there is no silver bullet yet in terms of an answer for any of these tensions. And so we do really feel like we have to choose. Um, and you know, the tension that we experience often is felt in a negative way. So we feel often like we're caught between opposing forces. Um, you know, that if we could minimize or avoid if possible, we would. Uh, but we don't. What we don't often realize, and this is sort of going to be my starting point here, is that tension can actually be a good thing. So it's sort of like the water bug that you see on the screen here, that's using surface tension to its advantage. You know, staying afloat, moving along with the water, and we can learn a little bit from this. Um, for example, so my background, as you said, is I am a psychologist. Um, I studied constructive developmental psychology in particular, um, and that takes actually a favorable view of tension. It recognizes that as uncomfortable as tension can be, it is actually absolutely necessary for growth and development and transformation. It's required, if you want to put it in more like dialectical terms, um, it is required for creating a synthesis um, between thesis and antithesis. And in order to create something new in us or in others, you know, um, in our customers and our clients, new insights, new ways of knowing, new ways of being, any of that, we have to hold on to these opposing forces um, so that we can incorporate them into a solution that's greater than the sum of whatever parts are pulling at us. It's a fundamental notion in development, not only of people, but of organizations and organisms of all kind. Um, and there are certainly um, opposing forces right now influencing market research. They're the same ones, frankly, that have been affecting social sciences for generations. They're rooted in different philosophical perspectives that actually guide our choices about what methods we use and what kind of information we actually privilege as real or true and how we feel most um, able to act and proceed with confidence. Um, so at the top of this list, perhaps, are the often competing goals of measurement and understanding. When you conduct or use research, you know, you have to think about what you're looking to do. What's going to make you feel the most confident? Are you, um, that you've really been able to isolate and measure a phenomenon with exact reliability, or that you have internalized a clear and maybe even a deep understanding of it? Um, I recognize that, you know, this is a bit of a false choice. You know, I would actually agree that we need both of these things. But what I'm trying to do here is make the point, uh, which is that underneath our very, very um, reasonable wish, I guess, to have everything, each of us does have a bias toward one kind of knowledge. And these deep assumptions, when left unexamined, actually can stymie us and prevent the kind of dialogue that actually has a transformative power. Um, they can keep us stuck if we don't kind of recognize where we're coming from, you know, on a foundational level. And that's problematic right now for us because we actually have the tools at our fingertips um, with technology now to measure and understand sort of an, at a, an incredible scale and at lightning speed. But in order to really make use of all this, we have to do the hard work of synthesizing some of these opposing forces. So I'm not going to provide you with a tidy synthesis, but I am going to do my part um, as best I can to try to hold onto one side of the tension, which is 
kind of arguing for not sidestepping the human and all of um, our, the evolving and emerging methods um, and data that we have today. So it should be pretty obvious from the title of my presentation and everything I've said so far that if I had to, that's, you know, I would come down on the side of understanding here, looking at the screen, um, and that, you know, given our tradition of survey research and probability sampling along with sort of our current use of cookies and data mining and, you know, our habit of delivering insights in 70-page chart-filled PowerPoint decks, um, that I really, I'm going to try to give voice uh, to the goal of understanding and research. Um, partly and probably mainly because things like co-creation and innov innovation and invention all really stem from learning or creating something new. So I think um, understanding like focusing on on really trying to understand and the insight that can come from pursuing that goal is more important today um, than ever. But let's examine some of the implications when you choose understanding as your goal. Um, when you do that, what you're doing is trying to really focus on the unique and particular experiences of others. You're, and you're valuing what you know you might call a subjective reality over an, an objective one. Um, and it's an important distinction because this implies that the truth we're seeking as researchers lies in part at least in the subjective sense or meaning that other people make of their own experience. So um, you know, it's not I'm not sort of negating sort of the you know the evidence that John just presented and the exciting ideas about things like um about um you know behavioral economics, but I am arguing that there's some gain to be had in listening to people and that and honoring sort of the, how they interpret and make sense of their own experience. So central to that process uh, is actually some is requires some kind of facilitation to service and support people in that process. And um that's a paradigm, you know, that kind of is reflective of my own background, but I think it has value for us and it's worth holding on to and paying attention to it. Um, similarly, the context in which that experience occurs is also vitally important to understand. Um, in experimental or like quasi-experimental -exper research such as surveys, context is often viewed as a nuisance. It's kind of a noise that we want to weed out or control for. Um, but when it comes to our very real and subjective experience of the world as people, context really can be everything. Um, just think about some of the examples John shared or, you know, any kind of time you're trying to get people to evaluate a concept, you know, packaging on the shelf versus in some kind of isolated research environment. It's really just not the same thing. And then finally, valuing understanding as a goal and by extension subjectivity and context means that we take um, the self-reported active meaning people make of their lives and experiences as useful and valid and um, that we need to find ways as researchers to evoke that and to be with people and experience that with people. Um, and to do this, we can't, we can't really have a voluntary, transparent process without engaging people sort of in full knowledge and with their permissive permission. So um, passive observation alone can't unearth the subjective internal material that's actually really useful for us in creating understanding. Rather, what we need is to engage people, um, and, and we need a means to do that um, once we get that engagement. And that, you know, really comes down to empathy. You know, empathy is um, it's a relational vehicle that allows us to create a shared understanding. Even when you don't agree and you don't see the same side, you can still have empathy. It's got ground, groundings in psychology in terms of emotional cognitive components. Socially, it's a function and product of relationship. And recent research has actually reveals, you know, in the form of mer mirror neurons, excuse me, that um, there's actually biological bases for empathy as well. Um, we can define it as the identification with or vicarious experience of the feelings, thoughts, or attitudes of another. Um, but it's important to bear in mind that empathy is not just a reaction. Um, it's not just this mere, merely sort of neurological, so, social, cognitive thing that happens to us in a passive way. Um, empathy is actually uh, a response. It's a facilitative action we take that supports people and can help people in their lives, how they make choices, helping them stick to commitments, how they grow and learn and achieve their goals, and how they develop. Ideally, brands actually would want to play an empathic role in consumers' lives, right? Um, because our favorite brands are the ones that get us. They help us figure out or express who we are. They reflect aspects of ourselves back to us. Uh, they help us weed through the noise so that we can do what we want to do. Um, product developers and marketers then, you know, should be interested in demonstrating accurate empathy, empathy to consumers so that they can effectively connect with people and, you know, have the honor of playing that facilitative role. Um, but they have to do it within relationships because that is where empathy is enacted. So marketers need to understand through empathy that you know rich complexity of people's lives and those particulars um, 
aspects of the context of their lives, and they need to demonstrate empathy, um, too, in the way they develop and disseminate products. So that's a marketer's perspective, but from a researcher's perspective, um, empathy is also really important. Um, empathic methods actually help us to surface and evoke and, and even nurture that internal meaning-making activity that so often can lead to the generation of new knowledge. Um, but we need to recognize as well that when we empathize as researchers, and this is sort of the crux of a lot of what I'm trying to articulate right here, is that um, we actually allow ourselves to be moved, right? So empathy isn't just something we do, it's something that happens to us as researchers in our response and our recognition, or if you want, our recognition um, is this reciprocal um, sort of reconstitution of sort of what we're trying to understand in the other person. It changes us emotionally, it changes the way, it can change the way we think, um, and even, you know, biologically helping us, and this change that happens in us actually helps us to understand in new ways and on a deeper, more intuitive level, um, things that are just not possible to learn through reading charts or reviewing data tables. Um, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. It's this very um, specific human and contextual knowledge, I think, that leads to insight and innovation. So this knowledge creation, which is facilitated by empathy, um, happens, you know, with, with the research participant, it happens within the researcher, and it happens in between the researcher and the participant in something that's really co-creative. So empathy is awesome. I hope I made my case for that. Um, but you know, there are barriers to actually um, being empathic and then acting on that empathic response, which is a natural thing that we all have. Uh, in some ways, and the stuff on the top left there, these are barriers that um, cons that um, we face because consumers are blocking our, our, our best intended attempts. Um, and I'll go into a little bit why. There are also some factors in our own traditions as researchers that are also getting in our way. Um, from a consumer perspective, we have become quite savvy about projecting and manipulating our digital identities, right? So our behavior has really shifted about what we put into the digital universe. Today, today in particular, um, you know, our online personas are really designed to be consumed by peers and friends and employers and any, you know, number of unknown fans or lurkers or followers. And if you doubt that, just think about the process you go through before you actually decide to tweet something or put a status upvote on Facebook and think about what you'd actually feel comfortable sharing in those settings versus in another environment, perhaps um, one that's a little more private or secure. Um, additionally, um, consumers are more empowered. So a recent Pew Internet study, you know, suggests that social network users um, are becoming more active in pruning and managing their accounts. Um, people are choosing to keep their profiles private and restrict access. So there's a problem, right? If consumers are going to shut us out, then we can't empathize with them. Engagement then is a necessary precursor um, to actually being able to empathize. From the standpoint of research professionals and insight professionals, you know, since basically the Enlightenment, Western thought has had a bias toward quantitative method, uh, favoring objectivity, independence of observation, all that stuff I was talking about earlier. Um, so qualitative information can be useful, you know, from that perspective paradigm, but it's, we don't often don't, you know, think of it as truth. Um, and with big data, you know, this is even a stronger trend that you can kind of sidestep the human in this process by gathering a tremendous amount of quantitative information on people passively and think that somehow that's the whole picture. Um, you know, I'm arguing here that it's really not and that what we need is to still um, not turn away from those methods entirely, but to elevate and um, the emphasis we place on humanistic research with methods that engage people on their own terms that will allow ourselves to react and respond with empathy. And I'm going to go through some examples now of all those three things that you see there, emotions, reflections, and context. Um, this is just a brief primer and it's you know, not, nothing necessarily new, but what you can see here is a picture of a drawing of the human brain. And I think that one way to think about keeping the human in the research process is to take a whole brain approach to it. Um, not necessarily left brain, right brain, but clearly, um, you know, letting the consumer be the expert and the author of their own experience. And everything in the top hand right really does that and enables that. There's a number of techniques that I'm not going to go into in tremendous detail right now about how to do that, um, but that, that needs to be balanced and used in conjunction with the more objective and more passive and more rational um, ways of getting information that you see in the bottom left-hand screen. So this here, um, I'm going to go into some examples now, and this here is an example from the mobile ethnography we did, um, actually outside of our typical community structure. The topic was the 2012 elections here in the U.S. Um, for this specific activity, we asked people to pay attention to moments in their lives where they were seeing, doing, or feeling something that they thought 
could be affected by the upcoming election. Um, and to give an explanation, we engaged 26 people, we got 100 submissions, and for example, in this entry, you know, something like the mundane activity of paying bills evoked feelings of cynicism and pessimism and even worry for this fellow, his name is John. He uploaded um, a picture to illustrate what he meant, which is a, an ad from a local um, real estate paper in, 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 his, in his local area. Kate, um, for Kate, the length of her cousin's tour of duty um, completely hinged on the election results, and this evoked worry um, in her. A night socializing and cooking with a friend who was terminally ill um, created mixed emotions here for Sarah, anger and worry, but interestingly often hope. And this is one of the few examples where um, anything related to the election actually did offer hope, which was sort of interesting. Um, and Jill, who is a teacher, was moved in a moment of disgust and anger and worry for her students when she confronted the uncertainty facing their future. So submissions like these underscore a couple of important points. First, um, when you get the pictures and the text and you know, there's geolocation here tagging as well, and, and give people sort of the power to express themselves in their own way and author their own experience, um, you will you sort of get their take on how they make sense of their lives, and that's really valuable. Um, as the campaign ads and news coverage mounted, we could see a stark contrast to what was actually shaping people's emotional and situational inner landscape here, and the actual content of the media and political propaganda that's being aired. And, and third, there's something really intimate about the images and language people used. We asked them to pay attention to how their daily lives were being affected, um, and gave them sort of the tools to actually tell us about it, and we invited them to make sense of their own experience. Um, this helped people actually move to a new place internally, so actually generate new knowledge for themselves, which they are then able to share with us, right? So in the words of one um, participant, they said, I never really thought before about how many aspects of my life were being affected um, by the upcoming election and all the stuff that accompanied it. I tend to think of it just the way I felt at the moment. This gave me a broader perspective. So, um, you know, when people generate new knowledge about themselves and can share it with us, then we can take that and turn that into insights and share it with the world. Um, because of the time, um, I'm going to kind of go quickly here, but I did want to share just one more example of emotion. This is a proprietary methodology called emotion-centric, where we use some priming um, techniques and um, a stimulus, and we actually have people generate modeling it sort of after free association, some of the feelings, and we ask them to name six about how they feel about any given concept, um, idea, packaging, it can be anything at all. Um, in this case, it was a ready-to-bake flan. And what I want you to pay attention to here is how different this looks in the output of survey data from on a one to five point scale on purchase intent or appeal or anything like that. What you get here is a sense that people, and these are frequency of thematic themes here, um, that was redundant um, thematic content. But people were ex excited and curious about the concept. There was a lot of hedonic pleasure. That's certainly a good thing that you'd want to maximize. But when you see that people were not just lukewarm about this conflict, um, con sorry, con um, construct, they were actually conflicted about it. So, you know, part of what was getting in the way of a really, you know, grand endorsement was the fact that people were skeptical skeptical about whether or not it would work, how it really would taste. They felt kind of guilty or sinful because flan is evidently easy to make on your own. So rather than just get sort of a quantitative, you know, gradation or top two box response, when you can actually tap into the emotional content that's driving sort of these opinions, you get a much more nuanced idea of what's going on with people and much more meaningful um, direction that you can take. Um, I want to share a little bit uh, about the process of reflection which is the second thing I was going to talk about in terms of examples. This is a study we did on sort of multi-generational caregivers. And what's important here is we asked people to really engage in this eight-week-long reflective process. And what you can see here is one of the first things we did, which was an image annotation, where we asked people to look at this ad and say what they thought about it and mark it up. And what we got was a lot of discontent, a lot of bitterness. You know, I can't afford any of this envy, envy, envy. Um, this was early on in the process, and you can see, you know, how it evoked a lot of rich emotion there, mostly negative. We also then, we transitioned into giving people more creative questions. This is a brainstorming activity about what kind of sandwich people are. And you can see that when you ask people creative questions, it actually prompts them to give generative responses where they create um, knowledge and, and create new ways of understanding their lives that they can then share with you. Um, this is an example here at the end where we ask people, you know, if they had to choose, um, if they could do anything differently, what would they do? And, what you see here is um, not a negative response. And after eight weeks of reflecting on this topic and this you know, very hard life choice, what we found is that people actually shifted their point of view and were able to find um, 
sort of more positive feelings in sort of what was definitely a really hard time, which was um, actually really helpful for clients trying to figure out how to have more um, sort of empathic messaging that was actually going to resonate with people in a much more realistic way. Um, I'm going to skip this example given time. This is a mind map, but if you want to look at it, uh, you can look at the ARF Digital and Social Media Study that's being released in the Journal of Advertising Research this month. Um, it simply talks, is showing sort of how we used a mind map to get at sort of the unconscious shopping process. Um, but that will be for another time, because I do want to cover off in the few minutes that I have left on, on the notion of context. Um, and these are both um, two examples from mobile ethnographies. So in support of a larger co-creation project around developing a new line of sense for product line uh, for one of our clients, we asked 20 women to send us photos or videos on any time they smelled anything nice. We also asked them to describe the scent that they liked about it um, and what it aroused in them. We got 16 out of 20 we invited to participate, um, and they had you know at least one contribution a day. And what I loved about the data we got here is that this, and the ideas of this for the sense, you know, everything from fresh cut grass to cookies baking to the smell of fresh paint that you see here, is that it came rich with emotion and significance. So scent elicits memories and feelings of comfort, relaxation, and and a sense of the particular situations in which these scents generated meaning for people. Um, because they could say, see the context, um, it kind of raises a gestalt in your mind about sort of what this, what is it? What it is about this scent that was actually really helpful for clients developing new products. Um, there's another. We did another similar one on sound. This is an audio clip of actually a kitty eating. <laughs> I have a cat, so this was very evocative for me. Um, another person submitted that the sound of typing somehow was calm and relaxing. I don't understand that at all, but you know that's the whole thing about subjective experience. I don't have to. That's her. Um, and also, you know, looking, someone submitted the sound of baking, frying, and there were hundreds of others. But what I found really remarkable about the audio clips um, is really what they evoked in me as a person. It was an immediate empathic reaction, which I got immediately. So I said I had a cat, right? And so hearing this stranger's cat pick dry food out of the bowl, um, you know, aroused all these feelings to me of just being instantly the feeling of coming home, the feeling of being comforted, the feeling of a sort of love for my little pet, all this stuff, um, it's very private, um, but it's, but it was really, you know, a, a recognition, a conjuring of some kind of, you know, constellation of emotion that was instant and complex and real and immediately um, understandable. So context is not a variable in an algorithm, but a situation that really can be evoked between people, between researcher and participant, and mutually understood. So I guess to conclude, um, I would say that I believe we need to continue to find ways to engage people and invite them to reflect on and share how they are making sense of their lives, that there's a role for that in research and it's important um, for, to triangulate that with other methods, but certainly not to lose it. Um, we need to participate in understanding people's emotional reality and how that is situated within specific contexts. So sometimes we can passively observe, but sometimes we have to really join with people. So as researchers and fellow human beings, we need to allow ourselves to do that joining and actually um, be moved as well. Because I, you know, I think about the challenges of synthesizing all the data that's out there and how much information that you know we take in all the time. And I think that that power of being moved and that empathic response is a way to really tap into and convey the immediacy of human experience that actually can help us work with our clients, elevate what matters, and, and, and inspire people to meaningful action. So I know I went a little long, but um, I'll stop now for questions.